Good morning. Welcome back to Reaper Pro Tips. This is me, your host, Anne. We do not have a disembodied voice, Justin. We have a disembodied hands, Justin, today. Hey, guys. How's it going? Looking at chat. Looking at you, chat. Looking at you. How you doing? How you doing? <clears throat> How is everyone? It's Wednesday. Wednesday is one of my favorite days of the week. Because it's usually the first day where I have, like, the entire day um, after this stream to work on stuff for the Patreon and things like that. It makes me excited. Yeah, it's dwarfing time. Yeah, yeah, we're going to actually get some account metallics on this bugger. I'm going to talk about what we're going to do. We haven't yet decided on an accent color, but he's, I like to paint these guys kind of like, um, kind of wowish. So I kind of like to do the fire giant, the mini miniature fire giant on them. Although they do tend to have grayish skin in D and D and white hair. Um, but I, I don't know. I, I kind of like the idea of doing him as a tiny fire giant. I kind of like how, I kind of like what wow did to their, their dark iron dwarves. Um, so let's see here. Where is my button button? There it is. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, Ferrisian, I haven't seen you chat for a while. Nice to see ya. Yeah, long long time no see indeed. Sweet. Alrighty. Oh, and I was going to grab my um, Scorched Metal also because we did do a couple of darker spaces on this guy with Scorched Metal. Boop. Hello, fancy man. Off for a snow day today. Ooh, yeah, it's getting cold. Dang, like, I'm so glad I'm no longer in Wisconsin right now. Like, insane, insane cold. Like, the negative 40, negative 50 that you guys in the Great Plains are getting, like Minnesota and uh, North North Dakota and South Dakota, that's that's crazy talk there. That's like, Anne runs as far away screaming as she can. I have no cold tolerance. I can tolerate 105 degrees and go out for a walk at 102 and be okay with it, but... uh but yeah, I don't, the minute it goes below the freeze mark, I'm like, ee! Still really effing cold. Yes. Yes, indeed. Yeah, negative 40. Yeah, I do not miss that, Reverie. That's where I grew up. <laughs> There's a reason I left Wisconsin, and much of it has to do with cold. The other, the other half is that I was allergic to the entire state, pretty much. 64 degrees. Yeah, War Shadow, we, we won't make them feel bad, okay? Like, I, I think it's pretty nice out here also. No, it's in the 40s here. Oh, no, it went up to 50s. But still, still, our, our weather is much nicer. We will not rub it in. Hey, Nomad Zeke. Yes, I believe in not rubbing it in. So let's see here. So remember we did a dark base cut on this guy because we're going to do some copper and stuff. Um, we have a choice. Now, as you can see, Dwarven Gold, which is a very red gold, and Coppery Orange, which is obviously a copper, um, are very similar in color. And the really re the re real difference here is the flake. Um, and we may just do kind of an example of both on this to kind of show you guys the difference. Oh, foot of snow, yep. Yeah, just stay inside if you're in the really cold, guys. Take it easy. Don't freeze your nose off. Yeah, yeah, don't freeze your noses off, please. Maybe I'll do this on a sticky note and kind of try to show you guys what I am talking about. Or maybe I'll do it on a little card. Do I have a little card? I do have a little card. It's going to be white, but we can paint over that. So let's see if I can get this to work. Eek, little little bit of top coming off and leaving bits on my paper. I hate it when I get like a new, new gray paper. It's flawless. And then, you know, I promptly drop something on it. I like having my gray construction backdrop. They're both kind of flaky after. They're just flaky in very different ways. All right. So right out the gate, you'll notice one thing. And that is that Dwarven Gold is much shinier, right? You can see the metallic flake in it a lot uh, easier. There's two reasons for that. One, it's a different flake because Bones uses different flakes with different flake technologies. Yeah. Thanks, Raywolf. Um, but this one is dar also duller because it has a lot more pigment in it, which it means that this is also going to cover better. So less, less um, flaky, shiny, but more coverage. Um, so yeah. 
So let's spread these guys out. Now I'm not putting down a dark base coat, but I certainly can put down a dark base coat and show you guys what I mean about shinies. Although dragon gold, as you can see, does not have, or sorry, dwarven gold, as you can see, does not have crap coverage. Like it's actually decent coverage. For a metallic, it's quite good. And it does have pigment in it. Don't make me, uh, you know, don't mistake by my commentary. Although you can see the streakiness, right? Yeah, you can see where it's like, you definitely would want to add just a touch of water. And people always ask me how much water to add to metallics. And the answer is you really don't want very much at all. You don't want to go any more watery than five to one or six to one. Um, oh, the paint's going to be fine, Mass Penguin. Uh, metallics are going to separate like they will it's just it's because the flake is is rocks <laughs> all of the non all of the non-toxic metallic flakes are actually based off of uh like a rock or a silicate kind of um like mica or silicate usually and so they're essentially rocks which means that when you put them in a watery base no matter how you know nice your base is they're gonna sink so you're gonna get separation it's a natural issue it's a natural part of the paint it's just the way it is now, if you get your paint and it is powdery, um, like it, like it almost looks like it's like the liquid is seeped out or something, then your paint froze. Um, this is not, this is a bones paint. This is dwarven gold, but it's very close to the copper when you look at it in the bottle. That's why I'm doing kind of a card example for you guys. So let's get this coppery orange going on. So right away you can see that it actually, even though in the bottle it looked like it was very close, coppery orange is actually darker. It has, um, you can almost see that it's got more pigment in it because there's more with every brush stroke. When you can see this dark going over the surface of the card, that's, you're looking at the pigment there. The flake itself, uh, doesn't cover. The flake does not actually give you any coverage, which is why so many metallics don't have great coverage, guys, because, uh, it has to come from pigment. Because with a metallic, you need the base to be very transparent and shiny because that's what's going to give you the maximum amount of shine. If you think about it, right, you have to have a really transparent base so that the shiny is so that it doesn't block the shine. Um, anything that's opaque is blocking light. That's why it's opaque. So if it's blocking light, it's not allowing light to get to the shinies and then the shinies won't be as shiny. So you can see that it's a duller metallic. You can see that you're getting a lot more flake action up here. This is going to, you know, as it dries. Um, but also, don't be fooled here. Now, there's something to look at. This is... By whose definitions of regal? Well, you've got a copper and you've got what's essentially a gold. But, but this is an illusion. This is an illusion that's based on the flakes. So, okay, remember when we looked at them in the bottles, they looked very similar. Then we put them on the board, and now they look very different. But the true test with metallics is tilt them away from the light. That eliminates all the shine. Well, look, they're almost identical in color. So that means that the only difference you're seeing in color from these, really, is due to the flake. And these are two different flakes. They are two different colors of flake as well. So... Whereas the Dwarven Gold is made with our new Bones Gold Flake, the older one here is actually made with a coppery flake, uh, a color that is not as gold. And that's why you're seeing it be more shiny and orange and not have this yellow coming in. See the yellow? Well, that's why I'm doing this, Shadow Raven. I have to teach. You guys need to learn about metallics. Like, people have all these misconceptions about metallics. Like, there's a reason they don't cover. There's a reason. Just put down a base coat. Hey, Dragon Eye. So, yeah. So, essentially, to say this again, um, as long as it didn't stay in the snow uh, and freeze overnight, you should be fine, Kroniko. Uh, undercoat always matters, War Shadow, but if you put the same undercoat under both of these, you would still get this slight difference. I mean, but you'd still get, you'd still get the similarity as well. So, like, if I put down, now, actually, if we put down the dark, a dark base coat, and then we put these paints down, what you'll probably see is the dwarven gold will get even brighter. Uh, I'm actually going to go with 91.99. Yeah, Chibi, if you're interested in metallics, this is your stream. Don't flop out. Don't miss it. Or go watch the VOD. 
This is where Anne talks about metallics and the paint chemistry of them and the way they work and the why they work. I decided that this was how we were educating you guys today. So let's put down some russet brown. A nice, beautiful, dark brown, very equivalent to dark uh, burnt umber in uh, traditional artist colors. A very versatile brown. Probably if I had if I had to have one brown with me on a desert island, it would be a toss-up between russet and ruddy, and russet would probably win because it's just more um, more neutral. If I had only one brown to live with for the rest of my painting life, it would be this one. So let's spread it out thin so it dries nice and uh, quickly. This, by the way, is a little um, card of watercolor paper that is sold by Strathmore. They sell them, I can't remember what they call them, but they're like little in the, little uh, trading card sized. They do Bristol and they do um, watercolor and I don't remember what other um, surfaces they do. But if you want a swatch surface and you want to be able to put it into a card organizer, this is a good idea. They, they won't run you cheap. Yeah, artist trading cards. Thanks, Anora. They're not cheap, but uh, but they are very useful. I just got paint on my jeans, so I need to stop and put water on it. Otherwise, they'll never come out. Well, that's not really true. You can use um, Winsor Newton uh, Brush Cleaner and Restorer to uh, help with that if paint fix fixes in your clothing. However, um, it works for me. It works far better if I just wet the area first. Um, that essentially will break up the paint just like in real life. It'll thin it out and it won't set. Ah. The top two are going to look even more similar. Like I was just saying a moment ago, Maritanza. Da -da. You can see that it, it's very hard to tell. And you can see a bit more of the coverage, right? Look at the top one. You can see more streaks than the bottom one. No one has knows how to cook under umber. Um, there's burnt umber and raw umber as colors, uh, just like there's burnt sienna and raw sienna, and they're very, very different. Um, but now most of the colors that you buy, most of the artist tube paints you buy are actually not, um, sienna or umber at all. They are a iron oxide, uh, analog that has just been futzed with chemically until it, uh, approximates that color and, uh, opacity and, uh, effect. But you don't want to cook sienna right. Like, honestly, raw sienna, the, the best, like, most usefulest color I never used until recently is, is quickly taking over um, my painting. The skin tone on my uh, Elven Templar that I've been working on is built with raw sienna, the tube, um, artist tube from Scale 75. But yes, yes, lots of people seem to like their, well, it's, it's like steak tartare. Some people like their umber raw. I never did. Burnt umber is my fave. I love this warm brown. You just can't, and you can't, I mean, it's just, it's lovely. It's lovely, it covers, and it's very versatile. So, all right, so now we've got a nice dark substrate. So let's grab our colors again and put them over this and see if it makes a difference. So we'll do Dwarven on, well, we'll do copper first because this is still drying a bit and it's more dry over here. So we'll do our, our coppery orange first. But yeah, so coppery orange has less of a flake um, shine to it when applied over white anyway. Let's see what coppery orange does when we apply it over dark. Um, you could, but it wouldn't change color, Neil. Now this is interesting because the copper is actually having trouble, more trouble over the dark brown. But it should make it shinier. Actually, I can't really say that because I put a glob of paint up here and I did not put nearly as much of a glob of paint down there. So part of this is thickness. That said, I'm going to blow on it and then put another drop on. Boop. Yeah, this is far less paint than I used up top. So here, let's put another little, another, another nice, nice layer on it. Do, 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 do. And then we will put more on the other side. Let me check my volume just in case, Sean. Hold on, I can look at that. It takes just a moment for me to open my volume mixer. 
then my sound settings and look at my properties. Nope, this still we're still good. My mic is directional, so sometimes if I'm muttering or I'm not um, talking like at full volume or I'm kind of muttering to myself, then it may not sound as high. Um, when I'm talking very loud and clearly, then everybody in the freaking building can hear me. <laughs> ah. Let's put some dwarven down and see. It's going to be funny if these coppers like act differently. I'm going to put more paint down this time. Nice thick coat like I did up top. We'll probably come back and add more. I'm using a flat to, uh, I'm also using a flat to apply these, which is going to matter. Like if I had used a softer brush, I would be having, uh, wouldn't be having as nearly as much streaking as I was talking about on my Patreon video last week, or I guess I put it up this week. I was filming it last week. But the softer of a brush you use, the better coverage you're going to get. Like the brush you use actually does affect your coverage with acrylics. And essentially the softer the bristle, the better the coverage. Because when you have a stiff brush, which these plastic bristles are quite stiff, versus a softer sable brush, which is a very soft brush, you are going to essentially, if you use the harsher bristle, you're going to be scraping the paint over the surface, right? It's, it's a harsher bristle, right? It's, it's a bristle. It's pressing the paint down and spreading it out. Whereas if you use a very soft, like a sable brush, it's going to be applying the paint much softer and it's actually going to give you better coverage because it's not going to be scraping the paint so thin. You may notice that you can't get as much mileage out of it because you're not scraping it thin. It's like butter over bread. So scraping the butter over the surface of the bread really harshly will make your butter spread more but it won't cover your bread as, as thickly, as nicely. Whereas, you know, going a bit softer handed with the butter means that you get to put more butter on your bread, which is, you know, since bread is pretty much existing as a conveyance for butter anyway, in my opinion, um, says the girl who did the ketogenic diet for three years. <laughs> two years, two years. Um, let's see here. I'm going to put one more drop of my copper down, though. And we'll do a comparison. And I'm going to use my soft brush this time because I realized I was, I was not soft brush, brushing it. Um, Emberton, it depends on the brand. If you are dealing with something like Master Series, I can tell you that Master Series shelf life is over 10 years and counting. Um, when I was still working at Reaper making the paint every day, I was using test bottles from original batches that had been made 15 years prior and they were still good. Um, that said, your paint, is, even with Master Series, you should shake your paint once a year, once every two years at the outside limit, in my opinion. Um, and, uh, every five years or so, maybe every, every three to four or five, it depends on how you, you see it. But after five years, the paint will definitely thicken in the bottle because there is osmosis going on. Air is still penetrating through this plastic. It's just doing it at a very, very low rate and through the seam. Um, now if you're dealing with a paint pot instead of a dropper bottle, then what you've got is you've got wider surfaces for the air to leach into in addition to the plastic. And you only have one lid instead of two lids. So that's why dropper bottles make the paint stay better for longer. So a paint pot might dry out in two to three years, whereas a dropper bottle can stay good 10 to 15. Now you can extend the life of even your canceled um, old pot paint by adding water. And I add water to this paint at least once a year. Because I really like this color, this old GW color, and so I keep it around. And I also store it upside down. That's another trick. When you've got this big wide thing that air can get into, you could block it off with liquid and keep it from like refreshing itself a little bit. It can give you a little extra shelf life just to do it that way. Whereas you never want to do that with dropper bottles because you've got an aperture and you've got something that can get easily clogged, right? It's a tiny little needle aperture that the paint comes out of. So you don't want all of your latex globs or whatever, or your, your, you know, your dropper agitator, if you've got it in there to sit down there and set and block your nozzle. So you do not store your master series paints upside down. In my opinion, in my experience, it's not a good idea. Store them on their side, store them on their top. Don't store them on their butt or on their, on their tip. Don't, don't store them butt up. Also, if the paint does separate or fall away from the top, it doesn't even really give you a good uh, example of the color. So there you go. It really depends, Amberton. And it depends also on how fluid the paint is versus how thick the paint is. Like 
um, something like a dry brush formula can essentially thicken and dry much faster because it's already very thick. Um, whereas if you've got a paint that's a little more fluid, like some of the fluid acrylics, which is a lot like Master Series, these are more fluid than your average hobby paint, um, they'll stay good a little longer. So hopefully that answered your question. It's all a matter of how fluid is the paint, how many um, area, how many areas on the jar or holding container are can air get into easily. Um, the other thing about pot paints is, of course, that you're opening the whole pot every time you use it. Whereas with a dropper bottle, you're squeezing out a little bit of paint and you're not really, you're not exposing the entire surface to air. And the surface that you do expose to air is smaller, right? Because you have a more narrow bottle, so there's not as much surface area being exposed as with a wider paint pot. And most paint pots are a wider profile because they need to sit stably on your desktop, right? They need to they need to be stable and not get knocked over. So that's that's kind of like an overview of why do dropper bottle paints stay good for longer? Why do pop paints tend to not stay good longer? If you if you thinned your pop paint, Games Workshop, Privateer, whatever, if you thinned it just a little bit and then you transferred it to like an empty dropper bottle, it would last longer just like a paint from uh, from a dropper bottle brand. Um, if your city water is really hard and has a lot of minerals in it, uh, distilled or spring or just filtered water, really, um, green users. Like, I, I don't find that I've ever needed it. Like, we had really hard water in Wisconsin, but I still painted with it straight out of the tap. Um, I'm a little more cautious uh, in some areas of the country. Here in California, the water is really actually better quality than I've ever had. Um, and I don't, I just use it straight out of the tap. Uh, but I had a friend, uh, Bobby Wong, who painted, uh, he was in Manhattan and they had really old metal pipes and he always used distilled. He was like, no way. It, it just screws with the paint if I don't. Um, so if you're in an urban area or an area with very old piping that still, um, still has a lot of metal in it, or you just notice that if you notice that your paint is just acting weird, switch just to filtered water. Um, you can go distilled if you want. But I, I always felt that distilled water was like overkill. <laughs> Because really, you just want something without heavy metals in it. You don't need to remove, like, everything. Yeah, I, I always shake my paints, like, I, I tend to use, like, there's a selection of about 100 colors that I use very frequently. And those get shaken, like, every month or two, usually, Reverie uh, and Amberdin. Um, well, actually, I mean, you just pour it. I mean, you could use a tiny funnel if you had one reverie, but I honestly, I just always felt, especially, that's why, that's another reason I thin the, the paint before I transfer it. So, okay, paint pot paint has t does tend to be thicker, right? So I'd put like 10 drops of water, uh, maybe a little bit of flow improver into this, shake it up really well, make the paint a little more fluid so that it pours out a lot easier, and I'd take off the whole top. I wouldn't just flip open the top of this and try to pour from that. No, I'd take off the entire top. Um, and pour it just very gently, just do it over the sink or do it over a bowl or do it whatever, uh, over, over a sheet of, of construction paper, whatever, so that you don't care if you dribble, um, and just pour it. I mean, I used to, if you, a funnel's great, but it takes time to clean and it also like will waste some paint. Um, there were times that I used a spoon, just, I got really good at using a spoon to transfer some paint, a small amount of paint into a dropper out of a paint bucket. But the ideal, like when I transfer, I actually... I have a bunch of gouache, which is a traditional artist medium that actually is closest to our paint, but it does come thicker in tubes like watercolor because it's opaque watercolor. I actually transferred all my gouache to Master Series bottles and thinned it to the consistency of Master Series paint so that I could use it easier. And I just poured it. I just, I squeezed it, I poured it, I mixed it, I did whatever. Um, Edit Bay, honestly, if... If you have good quality brushes and you don't leave them point down in your paint water, your brushes should stay really good. Um, but in general, what causes a poof brush, as we say, um, let's see, most of mine will come to a tip even when I when I add water. Like this one looks like a poof brush, but you should never like judge your, your brush when it's dry. You should always add water to it and squeeze it out. And if your poof brush, your so-called poof brush comes to a nice point, then your brush is not really a poof brush. <laughs> But when you are working with um, synthetic bristles at it, like this uh, orange, this red-handled Reaper brush is a synthetic. It's had, it had those orange bristles. White bristles are another true, uh, another tell for a synthetic brush. What a synthetic brush is, is paint companies using plastic to make tiny little hairs 
But because it is plastic and not actual hair, it does not have the resiliency of, say, a red sable like these brushes um, on my right. Um, and so what happens is the plastic slowly abrades. You can see how it's gotten spiky. Um, the edges are kind of fraying out. They're curving, right? So if you have a brush that's curving or pointing, kind of curving sideways at the tip, chances are you have a synthetic. It's something that happens to them and there's no way to prevent it. It's a, just a casualty of that. They're getting better at synthetics now. They're starting to really play with them and try to make them like really, really good. But if you want a brush that keeps a needle tip all the time, then um, the highest end red sable is your baby, like this one I'm showing you right now. Um, the other thing, though, is even if you're using a quality sable, if you leave it nose down in your paint water jar, you're going to ruin it that way. It's going to it's going to poof. It's going to you know, it's going to hook. It's going to because you're abusing the tip. Essentially, when you when you leave it in that paint water, you are not helping it. Um, no matter who, no matter if people try to argue that leaving it in the water longer makes it cleaner. This is not true. Um, and the other thing to remember about brushes is you only want to dip a little bit in the paint. Um, when I am painting, I typically only dip about a third to a half of my brush in the paint, and then I actually dab a lot of it off before I apply it to the figure. So um, that gives me better control, and I tend to use thinner paint, but it also keeps the paint from traveling up here to the ferrule, which is this metal part. If paint gets in here, it's going to essentially glob and dry, and it's going to push these bristles apart because some nice person in some factory spent a long time putting these bristles together. Um, in many cases, that their um, bristles are laid out by hand, at least partially, uh, to make sure that you get that wonderful tip and that they're all like nicely in line. Um, so essentially, when you allow paint to dry up here, it destroys that alignment, and that's why your brush starts having problems and splitting. You can use a brush cleaner. I use Winsor & Newton brush cleaner and restorer when that happens because I find that I need that extra power. It's a really, it's a non-toxic, but it's really powerful. Like it'll get up in here and it'll work out that, uh, that gunk. You can wipe it on a paper towel, roll it on a paper towel, and you'll see it coming out. Um, but uh, in the meantime, I mean, some people use brush soap a lot or conditioner. I, I don't. I will admit that I abuse my brushes. I'm bad about that. But I still have my brushes still come to a perfect tip. Even after a year of abuse, I wish I've been showing this recently. I have a brand new one of this particular size and shape of brush, and then I have one I've been abusing for a year. The one I've been abusing is obviously thinner, like hairs have like worn out, and it's uh, also shorter, so I, I obviously have lost hairs, but it still comes to a perfect needle tip and I can still paint with it. And, and the higher quality brush is going to be more expensive, but it's going to last you for years if you're taking care of it. So it's a good investment. I mean, you could blow... $30 on cheapo brushes and you'd run through them all before you ran through one of these guys at 15 bucks a pop. So yeah, it's just synthetic. Yeah, you do. Exactly. Exactly, Kernico. And I mean, you have to kind of work it out and it depends on how much you paint. If you paint a lot, I really, really feel that a high quality Kalinske Sable is your go-to. Like you could pay double that, that amount and for a real Sable and it was, it would last you a lot longer, right? So it, it depends on many things. It depends on you know, your price point, your own personal financial comfort zone, as far as what you're willing to spend, um, how you paint, how long you tend to paint per day, you know, how much you paint over the course of a year, how you take care of your brushes, all these things will factor in. Yeah, hopefully that all made sense to you. I, I deal heavily in science here. <laughs> I've been an artist for a very long time. I went to art school and I learned more. I'll tell you, I learned more from miniature painting about art than I ever learned in art school, which is either a testament to how bad my art school was or a testament to how awesome mini painting is. I prefer the latter. <laughs> well, any synthetic is gonna, guys. Like, okay, the best synthetics in the world right now, like there's a synthetic Kalinsky out there by Master's Touch, which is a Hobby Lobby brand, I think. And many people don't like Hobby Lobby. I know, I know, we'll just ignore that. But those are some of the better ones, and they're still going to hook. They're still going to hook. It's going to take them a little longer. They're going to deliver paint pretty well, but they're still going to hook. It's, a, it's the synthetic. It's the plastic. Until they figure out how to put together a plastic that is resilient to wear on the tip, but still has the properties you need to carry paint through that narrow tip, until they develop that, you're not going to see an analog. Like, you're not going to see a good Kalinske analog. They're going to figure it out someday, but they haven't figured it out yet. And when they do figure it out, we'll all be able to buy cheap brushes and still paint awesome. That's cool, Catnat. I do make an exception with my brushes, um, just because. 
Kalinsky sables are a nuisance animal in Russia. They actually, like, kill a lot of other animals. So I don't feel bad about my, my weasel, <laughs> my weasel brushes. Um, but yeah, if you are, if you definitely have, eth eth have uh, ethics problems with animal products, then yeah, then I would recommend going with as high a quality synthetic as you can. Um, because, uh, I mean, there are two, two schools of thought, right? A high quality synthetic is hopefully going to keep a better tip and you need that really good tip. You need it for your details on miniatures when you're working on 28 millimeter. If you're working on slightly bigger scale, you can get away with a, a brush that isn't quite as precise. But with these little guys, the, the tip really helps. So, um, there we go. Yeah, so there's some physics stuff. Really hot water. Maybe that helps like rehydrate. I don't know how it would rehydrate plastic. Usually plastic's hydrophobic, but I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's the heat, Kurniko. I don't know. Yeah, you could try. Like, try all your stuff. If you guys want to, uh, yeah, exactly, Reverie. It's like you're, you, what you, sadly, the quality of your materials does matter in any art-related or craft-related pursuit. So, if you, if you have nothing against a natural hairbrush, I firmly, firmly endorse what's called a Kalinsky Sable, they will always have the word Kalinsky on the uh, on the barrel. Kalinsky, K-O-L-I-N-S-K-Y. That is the name of a weasel. Um, and the grade one and grade two will usually run you between twelve and twenty bucks a brush, but it is well worth it. Like I said, they last for years if you take care of them, and they keep that tip. Um, so yeah, a Da Vinci synthetics. Oh, that's good, Gaston. That's good to know. I haven't tried their synthetics. Maybe I should order some and give them a whirl. I like to experiment with them because really the industry is getting a lot better with them, right? Um, so there's always improvements. Like I said, I for, I do uh, expect one of these art companies to hit on the right formula for the perfect synthetic brush at some point. And it's m even more hopeful when it's a company like Da Vinci that prides itself on extremely high quality brushes to begin with because you know they're not going to take a substandard product if they want to keep their reputation. So you know they're going to be working at it extra hard. And I'm a Da Vinci fangirl. That's the other brand I use. This is a Raphael, the one I've, the two I've been showing you. But um, Da Vinci is my other favorite brand. So... Yeah, it's probably got to be a heat reaction. Maybe it's like bones. Remember when you boil bones and they go back like to their original form? Like at some point you're going to abrade the tip so much that you're not going to be able to get that, right? It's going to be fr actually frayed. But I bet you can correct up to a certain point. That's very interesting. Thanks for bringing that up, guys. Now I can add that to my store of knowledge and maybe experiment with it a little bit. Anything physics related. It makes sense. Polymers, you know do tend to uh, want to fall back to their forms. So let's put another drop down here. Let's talk, talk about our coverage while we're... We've gone off on brushes and on paint and on paint life. But that's fine. That's what this stream is for. Never be afraid to ask questions. Never be afraid to interrupt. If it takes me a little longer to paint the model that I'm working on just because you guys give me a lot of good questions, I'm not going to complain. And also all the other people on this stream who might be newer... Um, you know, will be happy because they've had their question answered, one they didn't know to ask. So, yeah, I still have some of my art, my big flats actually, I keep for um, my big flats from art school, Reverie, I keep for a terrain painting. Well, try it. I mean, try some really hot water first, not quite boiling, um, and see what you can do. Yeah, it will still have the same problems. Right, it feels better. Right. I'm not getting any dropped frames on my end. All right, so here we are. Let us see what we've got. So now, notice, guys, notice right away, we're seeing more shine from this copper here. You know, we're seeing more contrast than we are with it over the white. Um, likewise, if you see this, you can see the shine, but if you see the shine down here, see how it's more intense, see how we're getting a more intense shine on both surfaces when you put the paint over a dark base coat. This is what you want. Uh, this is why we spent so much time base coating this dwarf in a dark brown because we want it to, we want it to have shiny. And the reason is that, okay, so this should make really good sense to all of you. More science coming. Do pay attention. <laughs> you guys who are just playing around. Um, so, all right. Think about this for a minute. 
So here we started with Tin Bits, or as I like to call it, Scorched Metal. For those of you who like the old Games Workshop Tin Bits, Scorched Metal is your analog um, from MSP. And so we started Dark there. But what happens when you try to work up highlights over dark? You have to, you're depending somewhat on opacity, right? You're depending, like, if you're going to put, like, scrapes and dings and texture, you need your paint to cover a little better. What are metallics terrible at? Coverage. So, essentially, when you start dark with a metallic, you're going to find it harder to work up. Whereas if you start with a very light metallic, it's easy to shade down with washes and paint because you can do whatever you want. You could go for a transparent wash or you could go with more opaque paint and put some more, you know, dings and scratches in and you won't have any problems, right? Because the paint is going to work with you on that. Um, but using metallics to bring up other metallics is problematic unless you have a very opaque metallic. And there are some out there and they, you have to watch the toxicity is the only thing. Uh, a lot of the ones that are a lot more opaque uh, are probably not using strictly non-toxic flakes, so please don't lick your brushes, um, because we don't know. <laughs> I can't vouch for their paint. Uh, that said, I do use uh, one of those colors, and it is the Chrome Model Air from Vallejo. Um, it's a very uh, pale white silver, and it is very uh, it has high coverage, so I can do scratches with it very well. Um, the equivalent would probably be mithril silver, but you want to put in a little bit of white to your mithril silver to get that fineness and that tightness um, to get the coverage as well if you're trying to do scratches. And then I would probably even put a gloss over the whole thing after you used mithril silver in that manner. So that would enable you to do the same effect. Yeah. Yes, pay attention to the science. There will be a test later. <laughs> I'm just not, you know, like, if, if you guys just are not listening, if you don't like metallics, like, I did this just for you. I did this project just for all you people saying, Anne never does metallics. Oh, it's more NMM. Oh, Anne never does metallics. But if you're, if you're bored, then, I mean, I would happily paint this in NMM. So, remember, I'm not a fan of metallics on 28 millimeter. So, no problem, Lord Dave. I was just ranting. Ranting at the masses who were making ping pong jokes while I was trying to teach them science. When I, when I chose to like, you know, make this, this set of episodes with this dwarf just for them, the ungrateful masses. Um, so yes, yeah, so at least some people are listening because this is your key. Like this is me teaching you to fish so that you will understand why your metallics act the way they do and how to get around it, you know, how to work with it. Yeah, yeah, well, you know, you try to do a good deed, and what do you get? <laughs> Ping pong jokes. <laughs> we could, we could get, I could get another dwarf and do NMM on it. Well, you can be curious all you want. Ask questions. I'm not complaining about the questions that are off topic. I'm complaining about the ping pong jokes where I'm like trying to give you guys information and all I see in chat is ping pong. Well, work up from dark paint, but not dark metals, Sean. You want to work, actually, you want to use the a dark base or dark or medium base, but you want to use as light a metallic as you can because it's much easier to put washes and shading over a light metallic than to try to work up highlights from a dark metallic. So, you know, you could do both. You could try both. It's just some are going to be a little more difficult. If you're looking for, I've just found it, it's very difficult to get real impact if I'm working up from dark metallics. Make sure I get commission. I wish I got commission. But yeah, so just keep in mind, keep in mind you're working with a transparent thing that is meant to go over a dark base coat for maximum shine. Now, well, I, you'd find me using much the same highlighting placement green users, just in different colors, right? And you, uh, the other thing with metallics, this is very hard to blend them. And this is why it works to your advantage to start with a lighter metallic and to work with glazes and washes and uh, opaque paint for your shadows because you can control those things. Um, whereas with the metallics, you, you blending with metallics is really hard. The only metallics I know that will layer in the whole world are our bones silvers, which I, is part of the reason they are actually, they actually exist is because mithril and filigree and blade steel will actually layer. That flake is fine enough to do it. I don't think any other flake on the planet is fine enough to do it. Um, than the stuff we use. Like, I was astonished that I could actually layer smoothly with metallics. I've tried every metallic 
um, and it's uh, it's it's work, shall we say? Yeah, you can, Max, and that'll call that'll result in something called demi metallics, or what we used to call demi metallics. Uh, painters used to do that a lot to try to get the best of both worlds. But what you're going to get is see this difference. This isn't just a flake difference. Remember the shininess of this versus the shininess of this. It's also that this has more pigment in it, and the more pigment you add, the duller your metallic will get. So. You can do it, absolutely, to get better coverage if you want to do that. I personally find that it's better to just base coat with a, like a um, cloudy gray is my go-to for silvers. Or even, uh, you could even make it a little darker, go stormy gray. I seldom go pure black, though, with silvers, unless I have a very good coverage steel that I'm working with. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, you will always have better luck if you doctor uh, craft store paints with, say, flow improvers and some mediums. It'll just generally help. Uh, it'll help with the flow properties out the gate. And it depends on what kind of base they're using. But if they're using a thick, goopy vinyl base, then yeah, anything you can do to it to help it be uh, smoother and more fluid is going to help you. Uh, unless you impact the pigment count too much. Yeah, they're very, very smooth. Yeah, the craft paint is super goopy, yeah. It's because they're using a vinyl base or something that's equivalent to a synthetic vinyl. That's the thickest base, and it gives you better coverage, but it's super cheap. Like, it doesn't have adhesion. Um, like, nobody in, in serious paint land ever uses it. Um, yeah. So, yeah. All right, cool, 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 cool. Just checking up. All right, so here we have, here we have our final results. So, yeah, so you can see the shiny and the shiny er. You know, and you even get more of a sense of the flake down here with this dark backing. Like I said, when paint companies, when, when pigment, uh, sorry, when flake companies send us their swatch books to try to sell us their product, um, I have always known them to show you the difference between the flake over white and the flake over black to emphasize that with a dark backdrop, the flake is more shiny. So again, you can utilize this to your benefit. If you don't want a very shiny base, you can just use a white base coat or a very light base coat. If you want something that's more like a silk or satin or a glaze, you can do that. But if you want that shine to really pop, you got to use something darker. That be the way it is. Let me see here. Let me grab a brush. And so all things considered here... If I want to start with my lightest, brightest copper analog, I think I'm going to have to start with the Dwarven Gold because it is lighter. And my base, uh, if I start with the copper, then it's going to be very close to my uh, scorched metal here that I have on my breastplate. I think I'm going to go with the gold. It is Dwarven Gold, and he is a dwarf, even if he is a dark dwarf. <laughs> oh, Lord Dave, you sell yourself short. It is definitely challenging. Part of it is that I have a squirrel brain. You know, like somebody brings up something in chat and I'm like, squirrel, squirrel, squirrel. You know, so I just have a squirrel brain. What can I say? All right, let's put some base code on this. Ah. I thought, hey, did the groundhog see a shadow? Like, that's always the excuse, right? If it's not the beginning of spring yet, and it's supposed to be. So, all right. I put, I'm going to put actually an extra drop. So let's try five to one with this, uh, this mix. So I've got five drops of dwarven gold, which is 94.51. In my palette, I'm going to take my bottle. I'm going to put one drop of water, five to one. You can and even should thin metallics for a base, but you do not want to thin them very much because, as I mentioned, when somebody mentioned separation in their bottle of metallic at the beginning of the show, um, flakes are rocks. <laughs> they are mica or silicate. Um, amyl, uh, amyl, 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 you know what I mean. Amylgrams? Amyl, something like that. I'm totally losing it because I needed more caffeine this morning. But, uh, so, okay, so two things. If you thin your metallic paint, one, you're going to impact coverage. And you already know that your coverage is crap. So if you thin too much, you're going to see that right away. Uh, two, your flakes are going to start falling out of solution if you go too, too thin. Now, you can get around this 
around the falling out of solution thing by using, say, like a drop of gloss medium. Don't use matte medium. Remember, anything that cuts uh, or makes something more opaque or less shiny is going to make your metallic less shiny because it's blocking light. So you could use a drop of gloss medium to uh, help. <laughs> the six seal was open in Arizona. Got snow. <laughs> ah. Groundhog Day is my single most unlucky day as far as my actual personal history goes. So I, I, I was indifferent to Groundhog Day before, and uh, now I just kind of grit my teeth and live through it. Uh, just in case the world decides to strike again. All right, so this is five to one. I'm putting it on with a very soft sable. Let's get some in focus here. We can get that out of the frame because we need to focus on the mini now. Mini, mini focus. There we go. And that's pretty solid. That's about the minimum I would go. Like five or six to one. It's even, I mean, I'm kind of globbing it on to get decent coverage here. Um, but the water is uh, is a good ratio. It's it's making it self-level. So, okay, if I put it over this, you're going to see it kind of falling off. See? So it is more fluid. So six to one might actually be a better ratio. You want it to be a bit fluid because you want it to self-level. And by self-level, I mean kind of spread out and not leave brush strokes. When you That's why you thin your paint um, when you, for base coats. News, news flash. Um, is so that you get a more even coverage. Because the paint will, if, will, if you leave a brush mark, the paint will flow together and hide the brush mark. Kind of like it does when you're in here, right? If you can pull your, pull your butt brush through it and see it close up right away, then you know that your paint is going to self-level. If you pull your brush through it and it takes a while for the paint to go back together, then you need water in your paint if you're base coating. But this is giving me a pretty good out the gate... Um, Color, and you can see how bright it is, how light it is. Look at it compared to that. It really stands out. And I wanted contrast here. I wanted these these plates to stand out against that um, that uh, scorched metal dark plate. So, because I, I kind of made alternating plate up here be scorched metal as well. You can see it there. So then this bottom plate is going to be the lighter gold. And he's got a shirt on under this, so I'm leaving the shirt for now. I'm going to work out my colors and see how it all looks. And then I'm going to decide on this shirt. And I think he's just got his arm there. It could be another undershirt. It's hard to say. He's wearing a, uh, he's wearing heavy armor. So it could be that this, this top shirt here is part of his padded, um, you know, surcoat underneath his padding underneath his plate armor. And that this is just a normal shirt. And I may just decide to paint it that way. Um, I'll probably go back in line here, but I think I'm going to put another, it can be hard to get metallics to read well on very fine and small detailed surfaces. So I'm just going to put a real heavy coat down on this bottom plate. So two layers. And I'm not going to care if I kind of get it up onto the plate right above it on the edge there. I can just line. I can always touch it up. Expect to do touch-ups touch -ups with your metallics. They like to get places. So we're going to do that. And then I'm going to look at his, I'm going to do the big plate. The big top plate with the ornament, whatever ornament you have, uh, is going to be this bright, bright color. Now, um, even though the flake now, the thing about uh, thinning is you can see more that this is a gold, right? It's going more gold than copper because we put it over a dark background and that makes the flake shinier. And the flake in this case is gold. We added a lot of red to it to make it that more reddish rich gold, but it is a gold flake. Whereas the coppery orange flake is actually a copper color. I think the technical term for the flake name from the company is bronze, but it's a definite coppery color. Um... So, uh, so we're seeing the gold now that we're putting this over this dark backdrop. So if we want it to really read more as copper, what we can do is we can shade it with more red and orange. And we can also highlight it by adding in white, white metallic. This is why this is for. Do not underestimate this color. This color better never go out of print because people aren't buying it because this is your highlight color for almost all metallics. Just saying. As Anne tries to hypnotoad you guys into buying more pearl white. Oh dear, the crocuses might just decide to sleep in. I have no idea, Smallish Sam. 
There's a wet palette gel with the metallics. War Shadow, in, in my experience, I'm not a wet palette user. Um, but what I have heard from others is that metallics do not act well with a wet palette. Part of that is probably that um, their bases tend to be a bit more fluid. Uh, and so they tend to act uh, like when water seeps up into that, they tend to separate pretty fast. Even if you have a thicker metallic, as you spread it out on your palette and try to work with it with your wet palette, you're going to see that water wake up into that paint. And the more water you mix with the metallic, the worse it acts. And that the worst ever is if it starts to creep, if the metal flakes start to creep across your paper and, and uh, hit other colors. So you, I don't think that uh, metallics work very well on a wet palette, just from what I've heard from all my friends. Um, you, your mileage may vary. If you figure out a way to make it work, I would say that it's probably going to be using thicker metallics. <laughs> yeah, um, that 9100 is totally, uh, it's underestimated a lot. <laughs> Yeah, wet pellets and metallics. Yep, they run. Yep, yep. Um, I mean, that's why I'm using a little water war shadow and in a small paint well. These are little paint wells. Like, there's my finger. So, uh, these are not the huge paint wells like the flower pellets. Um, this is the 28 well palette. So, it's got a lot of little pellets, uh, little wells. And so, what that does then is if I put at least six drops in, and this is five drops of paint and one big drop of water... Uh, it's going to stay wet for quite a while. But that is another reason to thin your metallic paint just a little. Um, it's going to keep it wet longer. Now, toward the end here, I mean, this is very thin up here on the edge, and I keep it that way. Uh, the other advantage of putting water into your metallics is that when you are using a ceramic palette like this, it will clean up a lot easier. Like, in fact, when I stop using this metallic, the first thing I will do before I move on to another color is to dump a bunch of water into it. Just grab a bunch of water from my, my cup and just totally water it out. And what that means is then when I go to clean up my palette, it will clean out a lot easier. These metallics have some of the highest acrylic content bases we use because that needs to be a shiny, durable base to fix this flake. That means that it's going to stick to your palette like nobody's business. So it's the, it's the hardest paint to get up off of a palette. And you will give yourself much help if you just dump a bunch of water into it at, at, when you're done using it. Yes. If you don't have metallics running, then you're probably, probably working with a dry or wet palette. That's absolutely true, Varl. Um, so, uh, it, your mileage, again, your mileage may vary. A lot of people, when they start using wet palettes, they don't quite know how much water they like or how much to dial in. Um, so do be aware that the more water you put in, that will actually change things for you and how your paint will behave, how quickly it will modify itself on the wet palette. I tend to like a very wet, wet palette when I use it. because I like pulling water from it to like mix with the metallics on the paper, but um, it does have downsides and it depends on what you're using. Like if you're using something that's really, really thick, like uh, scale 75 tube paint, then you can have a very wet palette and you are not going to have a problem. <laughs> it, will, it will take an awful lot for this paint to turn to goo on your wet palette. So it also depends on what paint lines you're using and how fluid or goopy they are. All right. And we're going to do, uh, let's see, that's got to get, yeah. Okay. Got a couple of different plates going on here. I think though, I've got to do this because I really do feel like it's that under plate. And then I'm going to do another plate here. I am leaving some of my dark brown just for lining. You'll notice, except when I'm going around my little shape here, that's because I might make this little nails uh, emblem that he's got going on. It might make it a totally different color. Haven't decided yet. So when I do pull the paint thin, you can see through it. And, you know, you could just put on two coats. This has been like, uh, how metallic paint works, uh, show. Ooh, you know what I have to do? I have to stand up and stretch. Hey, it's a sign of my, my back getting better, guys. It's the one hour stretching. So there, we'll uh, we'll put it, we'll turn him over. You guys can look at his, uh, his little dwarfiness and uh, I'll focus on him. There. Let's do our stretches. Yeah, how wet is wet is always a tough lesson. You're right, Dapid Weir. And, and plus, everybody's using different brands, right? Everybody's using a different sponge. Everybody's using like, you know, 
Um, I'm pretty sure that the three nails emblem was probably something Talon came up with, Pendrick. Uh, I mean, I'm I'm guessing. Either that or it was a way... I, I bet it was a um, concept artist invention, and they just went with it. Oh, yeah. Hey, Carrie Michael. Yeah, this one, this one is very much worth um, going back and watching this VOD. So anybody who's coming in late, as I sit here and stretch, just don't mind me here while I do my stretches, um, and give my back a break. Uh, at the beginning of this, we talked and directly showed how metallics cover, how you can get better coverage, how um, the back affects the shine. Uh, we talked a lot about the formulations. We talked about paint preservation. We talked about we talked about a lot of stuff this time. So there's some really good information toward the start of this show that if you are a metallics user or you want to get better at metallics, it will help you understand why your paint acts the way it does. So do go back and watch this VOD. That's, that's all I can say. Uh, let's see here. Did you hear that Netflix bought the rights to all 22 Redwall books? <gasps> no, I didn't, Kerniko. You just made my day. Oh, oh, and David is going to hate me. <laughs> I don't know if he'll watch it with me. Oh, man. I can't wait. Okay, you've just, like, made me super excited. I'm going to go and, like, Google that when we're done. Kerniko. Because Redwall. Well, I mean, it makes sense, right? Yeah, stupid Netflix. <laughs> well, you know what? I'm happy because, you know, I had to deal... I grew up, what? I grew up in the 70s and 80s. There was such crap TV programming during that time with the ex small exceptions. Like, I'm kind of happy that these other, like, streaming services and, like, other networks are starting to really put out huge, high-quality content. I love it. I love it, I love it, I love it. Have a watch party on the stream oh boy that's a good idea yeah there was already one animated red wall but wasn't it just the first one someone sent us a brother oh no twitchy twitch you dislike netflix lately i'm sorry we use netflix to watch shows david and i in the evening i'm gonna do my cat cow Real quick, do my spine stretches, and then we'll stand up and do some stretches. And then we'll hydrate, and then we'll resume. <laughs> oh, PBS did it. I remember ages ago, right? Right? Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm all for more networks putting out good quality stuff. And if some of that stuff happens to be like, you know, movifications or showifications of my favorite, you know, fantasy stuff, then I'm all for it. The thing I always forget to do with cat cow is I forget to press the bottoms of my the tops of my feet and my fingertips into the ground when I do it. back arches and extensions make me happy get my spine my spine has been getting much better yeah it is a good time to be a geek yeah the Anne McCaffrey Dragon Riders of Pern that would be I mean that was what, how, what got me into sci-fi and fantasy with Joma those are the, that was the first sci-fi fantasy series that I ever read ever when I was a kid I was so obsessed with Anne McCaffrey and Pern that I actually built a snow dragon that winter. I, I kid you not. It was about as long as I was. It was crouching, and I actually did build the neck up because we got really sticky snow. There we go. Stretches. Remember to keep your core engaged. Yeah, I don't know. I Robert Jordan lost me at book eight. I keep being tempted to go back and like read the Brandon Sanderson uh, ending. 
But then I'd feel like I had to, like, maybe I'll just have to read the cliff notes. Like, I don't want to reread all those books. Because some of the characters really annoyed me. Yeah, reading it. I mean, I, I got through the first eight books because I was working at the game store in Madison during that time period that the books were coming out. And uh, my coworker and I had nothing in common except, like, reading. And so I started reading that series just so I would have something to talk to him about. <laughs> and so I got through eight books before we stopped working together. And that was the eighth book, Path of Daggers, was out at that point. And so I read that one and that, that was, I was pretty much done. Um, I did not go that far because my parents would have killed me, Pendrake, but, uh, haha, <laughs> twisted Emma. Yeah, well, it's never the same writer, right, Amberton? I mean, that's, I mean, as a writer myself, I totally get it. Like, if, if I tried to write, you know, a book in the spirit of one of my favorite writers, like, I could maybe do some of it justice in some form but it will never be the same it's like you know it's like dorothy sayers who's a mystery writer you know from the 1900s that i whose books i adore they found somebody to carry on writing her her peter whimsy mysteries she's a good writer and she captures much of the spirit of whimsy and his wife but she doesn't have the magic like she's not she can't just hurl like obscure drama quotations off the top and classical literature locations off the top of her head out of her character's mouths like the original writer could like and so and you lose a lot of the period because she didn't live through it like the original writer did um and stuff like that so it's like it, you can do it but you never it's never quite the same i haven't read todd's works on pern i think or i read dolphins of pern maybe but um, but I, I just, I'm, I've moved on a bit, but yeah, it's never the same. It's every writer really gives a lot of themselves to their work. And so it's like a painter trying to take over somebody else's legacy. It will never be exactly the same because they are not the same person. So all things change, all things pass. You just enjoy the stuff you did get. Again, I'm going to alternate plates down here, even though I forgot to color that one in with the uh, scorched metal. I can grab it in a bit, but I want to want to get this plate lighter here and alternate. If I alternate, then I can get extra extra drama. The problem with Dark Over, though, Chibi, I think, is a lot of the older fantasy that I go back and reread, like, it's it's definitely a product of its period, and I get kind of uppity about how little, like, how unpowerful some of the female characters are. Not so much with Marion Zimmer Bradley, but some of those are um, not as enjoyable for me now. Some of them I, I directly face palm and go, oh my gosh, I was reading this as a young girl. Um, so, you know... Not saying we need to PC everything, but, like, there is definitely stuff that that I'd be like, well, I don't know. And then, you know, if they did change it, they'd take hit for not being authentic to the source. And so I don't know how I feel about those. That's some of that stuff. Yeah, Norton, uh, yeah, I remember. I remember the Andre Norton stuff for sure. I remember much of that stuff fondly, but even like one of my favorite children's series, I go back and read it now, and I'm so frustrated with how like the female character is only empowered in a way that's acceptable for women to be empowered. Like, right. I'm just, I don't know. Maybe I get a little bit into this, but anyway, there's still, I still go back and read them and I still enjoy them. Although I haven't read, reread Andre Norton for a while. Maybe I should. What are your favorite, like newer authors guys in, uh, in fantasy? Do you have any like, like newer fantasy authors that you really, really enjoy? 
Oh. Um, Ward Shadow. Uh, the Tim Bits will have to be, or sorry, the Scorch Metal will have to be highlighted. And that, yes, the gold will be shaded. But I have to block it all in first. Once I, you know, it, it makes sense to block it in first because the shading colors, uh, you know, once I've got them mixed up, I'm going to want to just use them all over the place. Silver would probably have been a better uh, metal to use just for a pure demo as far as metallics, but this uh, this model was more likely to have a bunch of like coppery gold in my opinion. So hmm, Elizabeth Moon, David. Oh, David Weber's good. Haven't heard of Shannon Hill. Well, CJ, I mean, CJ is like one of my all time, probably my all time favorite sci-fi writer, CJ Cherry. I own all of the Foreigner series and I mean all of it. Not just digitally either. It's taking up a huge part of my bookshelf right now. She uh, signed my um, my original copy of Down Below Station. It is a very very worn out. Um, I don't. Th it might be a first edition. If it's not a first edition, it's a first printing. Mark Lawrence, huh? Okay. Computer geek was talking about a computer being able to get through it. How old is this thing? Yeah, Twisted Oma, if you know anything, right? Just shows you how far we've come in a relatively short period of time. Let's see here. Yeah, I think that... Um... The books are, yeah, the books are good. I mean, those are a team of writers writing the, the Expanse books. Ty and Daniel writing under one name. Although they each write different characters. And then blend it together. It's rare that you can have a, uh, oh, I love Ilona Andrews. I love her stuff. Uh, I agree with the Honor Harrington uh, Shadow Raven. I think, I think every series, like, it's hard to tell... Like, I don't know. I mean, as a writer, do you get so attached to your series after a while that you just don't want it to end? Because I agree that on the Honor Harrington series would have had a natural arc maybe at five or seven books and that it did go on, like, a bit much. I really like the first books. I've kept the first books, but not so much the latter Yeah, Patricia Reed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true, Karinko. It does suffer from that. All of, but you know what? That's what their readers want to believe, right? Is that you can, you can have it all. On that front. That said, I love her world enough that uh, I've kept reading them. Oh, no, that's cloth, and I painted it metal. Eek, eek, it's because it was dark. That's right, I wasn't sure if that was part of a plate or not. Yeah, but it looks like cloth, so let's grab some water, scrub it off. I mispainted that part. <laughs> yeah we all have our favorite series and book a book that we wish would get turned into a series with like that perfect choice for casting right ah uh, let's see this middle plate i think i want that to be i think i'm gonna go dark with this middle plate here guys even though i didn't with this one up here and the reason is that we've got the manacles over the top of this the handcuffs um, if I put light metallic in here, it's going to be harder to get these metallic, these handcuffs to stand out because I'm going to do them in silver. Um, whereas if I put the scorched metal in here, it's going to be very much easier to uh, make that, uh, the lighter silver cups stand out. Hi, <laughs> RX78. Ar I remember the Thieves World books. The different anthologies really had, I think, a differing level of quality. I think that's true of any time you've got an anthology world. 
Yo, Zambies. I missed it. If you, there you are. There you are. Yes, we're here. We're, um, we're base coating metallics, one of the most boring things in the world. Um, once again, now notice, okay, so I'm putting down this scorched metal. Scorched metal is one of the metallics that covers the absolute best. And the reason is that it's got a lot of black in it. It's a very dark metallic. Uh, so I don't need to use as many drops of this, um, to get decent coverage. So let's put it over here. I'm going to just grab some tin bits or some scorch metal and show you guys how well this covers over white even. So there's our scorched metal. It's a beautiful scorchy brown metallic. I love it. I love it very muchly. Um, it's one of my favorite metallic cover colors. I don't usually get to uh, use it. It has a copper flake in it. And then it's got like colors like black and purple added to it. So it gets, it's a very interesting um, metallic, this brown one. Um, the um, Ilona Andrews is actually a husband and wife writing team. They may have, they've got a lot of other series going on now, so they may have put a, they may have either like, like soft finish the Kate series or put it on hold. I mean, it, it was a lot of books. And I respect an author who like, you know, it's just like, well, I can't really do anything else with this. <laughs> I liked some of Feist's stuff. I didn't read Rosenberg. I remember David Eddings. Yeah, 80s fantasy. What can you say? It was a thing. All right, so we got some of that dark metallic where we didn't get it before. And like I said, I don't have to worry about coverage with this one. It's going to go on and it's going to stick and it's going to be a nice solid coat. I don't have to uh, put any extra effort into it. All of our dark metallics are like that. Um, adamantium, um, gunmetal blue, those are all metallics that already start with a heavy base load of black in their formulations, so they cover really well. Um, Mr. Deathridge is, uh, you can mix them all you want. I mean, they, uh, the biggest thing with metallics is crossing flakes. Because every metallic is going to have a particular flake it was built with, and they're going to be different colors across different metallics. So, and also the pigments in them. So, like, if you tried to add black to this gold, we would end up with a greenish, kind of mucky color because you'd be adding black to yellow pigment. So, and you're also dealing with a yellow flake. So it'll, it'd be weird. It'd go green. Uh, it'd go greenish. Um, and maybe you'd like that. Some of our greenish colors, like old bronze, are made that way. Um, but uh, then, you know, you also, like, if you're doing something like pearl white, like using pearl white to, um, to highlight something, that white is also going to interact. Both the flakes are going to kind of work together or against each other. And they are going to uh, react. So, you know, in, in line with color theory. So if I put a drop of pearl white in here, it's going to go more pinky orangey like new copper. If I can actually get my uh, pearl white to come out. Come on, pearl white. Seriously, I extol the virtues of you so much. Boop. So pearl white is a white metallic flake in a white base. This means that on its own, it is not very shiny. However, it is a great highlighter for other colors. So now we mix this in. See, it's like new penny copper. Ta-da! So the pearl white color can be used to lighten other metallics. I use it to lighten our blue metallic. You can use it to lighten, you know, a gold. You can use it to lighten a copper and get a very realistic copper penny look. You can see how, how much that looks like actual, like, light, bright copper, which is fantastic. Um, 
So in that way, I, I mix metallics regularly for my highlights, and I usually am using for uh, for very for gold metallics. I might use new gold first because it's our lightest, brightest metallic, most yellow, and then from there I would probably mix in the pearl white. Because a lot of golds that aren't new gold are going to have like brown or orange in them. So when you try to add pearl white to that, it's going to like kind of make a, it's going to muddy them a little bit. They're not going to be as brilliant. And whereas in new gold, all we've got is yellow pigment in there, yellow and ochre along, um, along with a flake. And so pearl white works great and it makes a pale gold when you mix these. Does that make sense? So you have to follow your normal color mixing kind of strategies when you are mixing metallics, like kind of, you know, remember these things that each metallic has a flake that's of a certain color and it also has pigments in it. Uh, it's not just the flake usually. So that means those pigments are gonna mix and those flakes are gonna mix and it's going to react accordingly. So you wanna do test mixes when you're trying to figure out a way to highlight things. Yeah, exactly, swatches. I mean, that's, Sadie's right. If you want to know what happens when you mix this and that, then do your swatches. Um, however, notice that I am right about this, actually, this orb and gold being a lot like copper, because when we drop white into it, what does it turn into? Copper. So that tells me that when I shade this, um, I'm, if I'm going up with this, I need to play heavily to the reddish hues, probably, uh, to bring this less of a gold and more orangey red, so that when I put this highlight on, it will make sense. Otherwise, it's going to be like this gold is going to fight with this white and who knows, right? Yeah, if you like metallics and you just came in, um, Mr. Detheridge, um, you might want to go back and watch the VOD of this because I talk a lot about metallics and how they work at the beginning. Like we were doing swatches, I was showing how the shine will change and how these colors look different until you tilt them away from light and suddenly you see that they're pretty much the same. Um, you know, so I talk about a lot of stuff and how, about how metallics works and how they're formulated. Um, so it can help you if you are wanting to up your metallics game. So even though we are doing very simple, uh, stuff as far as getting our base colors down for this metallics project, uh, today, we are talking about a lot of extrapolated stuff about metallics and working with them. Um, I added a little bit too much water to my scorched metal accidentally threw a brush full of water in it. It's well, habits are hard to break, right? I'm so used to thinning my paint. And I, I since I'm not gonna use this copper right away, what I said, guys, I'm just gonna drop a big swirl of water in it. And I'm going to swirl it all around the upper side. What that does is it, it impacts the edge of the paint. Look at that, can you see that movement in the middle? That's Flow Improver like reacting. And the, the, some of the paint is, some of the flake is floating, some of it's sinking. You're getting a lot of that action. When you see swirlies in the middle of your paint, that's a sign that your paint is kind of sinking or settling out once you've added water. Um, when you see something like this, where you've got a metallic circle in the middle, you've got too much water in it, you should add more metallic if you want it to be usable, if you're base coating with it. Because it is separating out. That's a sign that it's separating out when you see this flake gathering toward the center. It should, it should remain spread throughout. Remember, flake is always heavier than water. I personally prefer to just use regular paint pendrake because if you look at a metallic in its shadow, it is not shiny. Um, so if you want to make a darker steel, yes, you could drop a drop of adamantium in there, but be aware that, like I said, adamantium, like I mentioned, every metallic has different pigments and different flake. Adamantium is made with a different flake, so it's not made with the same silver flake that our silvers are. That means that you're going to drop, you know, you're dropping not just more black pigment, but actual, like, almost black flake into a silver flake. Um, so it, it is going to mean that you can't just take that easily up again. Um, so just, you know, that's things like that to remember is that your flake may also be uh, a thing. Now with our th something like our green to kind of demo and talk about that a little bit more with something like our emerald green, that green, if you look at it, has a very gold shine to it. That means that it's made with, with gold flake, which makes sense because green tends to highlight gold as far as, you know, it tends, if you highlighted it toward white, it would be a minty green, right? And everybody doesn't want that. So we built our green with gold. But what that means is that this is actually your best highlight color for that green using some new gold and then switching it up by adding in some pearl white. 
So that's something to remember if you're working with our Emerald Green. I always liked it for green dragons, personally. I think you can get some really cool effects by highlighting metallics on dragons and shading. I don't know if I'd do it for a huge dragon, because that's a lot of metallic work. But it is pretty cool on a small dragon. Don't think I'd do it for Maldrakar. There. Block in all of our... Get all of our metals figured in here. Or at least enough of them. Um, I mean, if you look at it, it should tell you, D. Clearman. The bones metallics tell you very clearly that the, you can see that's a gold flake. You can see this is more of an orange flake. It's not going nearly that yellow. But part of that is also the physics of those flakes. They're two different. Chemically, they're very different. They're two different materials. Like I said, the bones metallics are mostly new tech. So they work a little different. Um, but you just got to experiment. In general, though, the darker the color, the darker the flake. But again, it varies. It it was it's pretty much me going, what flake will give me exactly the color I want? That one. And experimenting till I get what I want. But I mean you should be able to tell more or less. All, as I mentioned earlier, Shadow Raven, all metallic flakes are stone based. They are usually mica or silicate um, conglomerations that uh, are directly based on rocks. That is water soluble metallic flakes. When you get into the solvent based metallics, that's when you are working with actual metals often of some sort. Because you can get away with some of that stuff and it's not water friendly. Sometimes very incendiary, incendiarily. So. When you're working with metallics that are solvent based, you can use a whole range of different flakes. Some of which I'm jealous of. Um, that work very differently from your water-based flakes, but your water-based flakes are going to be stone-based. Rocks. They're rocks. Really translucent, finely ground rocks. Minerals, I should say. They're mineral composition. I haven't actually looked at those. I've heard that the Vallejo metal color, the new Vallejo metal colors are, are really nice. I kind of wonder if they're just using the flake that they're using in their air color in that metal color air dust because the old Vallejo metallics were a lot like MSP metallics, um, at least when I was using them. But their new metal color seems to be a different beast. And if I had to guess, if they hadn't, if they didn't actually embrace any new new technology, then uh, the flake that they were using in their model air was uh, superior. So I'm wondering if it's much the same. Um, but no, I haven't checked them out. Uh oh, I forgot to do... Oh, that's because there's a belt there, and I figured there was going to be a belt there. All right. I was like, wait, I missed a spot, but I didn't really. So yeah, I haven't. I mean, um, I'll be the first to say that, like, MSP metallics are nothing, like, super special. They are functional, and they are useful because we give you a lot of different colors of them. Kirill from Russia actually really liked our... Um, the fact that we give a red, orange, yellow... Yeah, we, we do a green, blue, and purple metallic. You know, we do pretty vibrant ones. Um, he really liked that. He was doing, like, heat patterns, heat discoloration patterns with them. And he was pr pleased with them when he was here teaching. Um, but other than that, and the fact that we have the pearl white, which is kind of equivalent to metal medium, but it does have some white in it, so it will actually lighten and highlight your colors. Um, I would say that, you know, metallics are something that we have never excelled at because we are very focused on non-toxicity. And that limits the type of flakes that we can put in our paints. And other companies are not necessarily focused on that as much. That's why I never say I can guarantee whether, you know, another company's metallic, like, is non-toxic. That's why I tell you not to lick your brushes. <laughs> because you just don't know. Um, 
And some of those non-toxic, some of those more uh, not non-toxic pigments may be better. Um, but yeah, we just go with rocks. <laughs> that said, a lot of people actually like our metallics and say they photo better. Um, but yeah, your mileage may vary. Yes. But yeah, I haven't actually looked at the, the metal color yet. I don't, honestly, I do a lot of NMM Aerodesk, so I'm, uh, I don't reach for metallics very much unless I'm doing something really big. If I'm doing something really big, then I actually like working with metallics, like a big bust um, or a statue. Then I then I have fun with metallics because I can do so much with all that area. But I almost never, like this is a very rare exception. I almost never use them on miniatures. I don't like them. So that would explain somewhat. I, always, I keep forgetting that the Vallejo metal color actually exists. I'm gonna actually make a little sticky note of it so I can go and check it out online. I have a bunch of Vallejo's other metallics, the Model Air, uh, because I like the Model Air line. Uh, let's see here, da -da 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 -da. metal. So yeah, by Dragon Eye. Uh, let's see here, metal color. Yeah, I'll look. Maybe it's interesting. Usually, metallics I'm not as reliable on, but usually with other companies' paints, if I smell it and use it, I know what it is. Uh, it's the smell test. Well, the, the big version of the dwarf here would be the fire giant, right? So I already did one, partially. The problem with giants, though, is they just take so long and I run out of oomph on them. But yeah, just pretty much with metallics, just whatever you want to use, guys. Try them all. Like I said, there are some advantages. Like I said, the bones metallics, as far as the, our silvers, are the only metallics I've ever found that layer. Uh, I don't. I'm not really interested in checking out a lot of metallics. I don't find I actually need them. Dark star, huh? Well, what do they have? Here you go, Amberton. If they're interesting, what makes them interesting? Tell me what they're... Is it because they've got a bunch of different colors? That might interest me. Do they, if, they, if it's something like if, that they airbrush well, then that's I'm less interested then because I don't really airbrush. But what, what makes the dark star metallics in it um, really good? And what for that matter, uh, tell me what makes the Vallejo um, metal color good. There we go. Got some nice solid. Well, a lot of the, those mica powders are exactly what most companies use as metallic flakes, D. Clearman. So you're probably already doing things with them. The question is how fine are the grinds in the in the retail mica powders? Like, because that's what, you know, with us, with paint, we're usually working with the super fine. Um, and I don't know what grade of grind the commercially available um, ones are. So, oh, really? Yeah, I didn't know that, Pendrake. If I knew that, I might have started with one, but I was trying to do a metallics on a, on a small model because that's what you guys tend to paint. Bright high shine. Interesting. Yeah, wide range of colors is always good with metallics. I mean, it gives you options. It gives you options. Yeah, high level shine. Mm -hmm. And that'll be like, that's going to be the flake. Shake, the shine is almost always the flake. Unless you get a very, unless they're using a very high gloss um, base to put them in. Which usually is not the case. Not if they want washes to work well over them. Yeah, the Pearl X is going to be a super fine, I think, Carrie. Oh, are the Dark Star a paste? Interesting. That was done in the old days, like the Dragon Scale colors from Partha, I think. Partha or Grenadier, can't remember. I see. They cover really well. Yeah, that, that says to me that they're using the um, same flake as they're using for their air color, which is a really fine flake that covers well. 
and those also the air color also take um also take washes and and colorants really well so that says to me they didn't reinvent the wheel there that says to me they they found they saw the other product and they saw the reception and said how can we use this in a different way that's funny partha you still have one yeah that figures i remember those to me, it sounded like more work than I wanted to do. <laughs> Interesting that some people are experimenting with it. Well, I just, I always am interested in how the art market experiments with stuff and reinvents stuff. Rhonda was just telling me, Bird with a Brush, Rhonda Bender, was just telling me how uh, Golden and Liquitex are both like reinventing the miniatures paint. Like, they're both going for fluid lines now, you know, with that are more matte. Like, it's like they finally realized, after a bunch of traditional artists started using miniatures paint, <laughs> they finally realized that people maybe wanted a, a, an acrylic paint that wasn't glossy. Yeah, I don't remember. I'd have to... I'd have to look at what our grind was for the other ones, and I don't have that literature anymore. It's all in Sadie's hands, Steve Clearman. You'd have to experiment. But in general, um, a larger grind is going to look glittery, obviously, because you're going to have bigger particles. So the, the, the finer grinds are going to look more like metal, and the larger grinds are not going to look like metal. They're going to look glittery. So... <laughs> We at least, I don't know. I mean, like I said, the other, other paint companies have different qualities. And so if you are using a brand and you're like, like, well, this isn't quite what I'm looking for, try other stuff. You should always try other stuff. Because everybody's style is different and what everybody is looking for out of even a metallic paint is going to be different also. So I think I want dark metal on the hammerhead here. And I can highlight it. See how that works. That way to let us let us get some try to highlight the dark metallic and see how it works. And I can show you how hard it is to actually make blending work on metallics. But yeah, it's uh I I have used a range of metallics and if I if I painted with metallics more I would probably own more. But I love NMM so much. I love non-metallic metals so much uh, these days. I, I still, like, hate parts of it. <laughs> but to make metallics look good, like, like I said, I enjoy metallics on really big things. Like my Mr. Grumpy Bust and my Soldier 76. Really, really big stuff. And then I really love metallics. But, uh... Hmm, I have to figure out his feet. His feet also have metal. Of course they do. He's a dwarf. Horrible resin. Interesting. And we've got our uh, here. The other problem, uh, you really need to make sure you've cleaned your model well with metallics. Because if you've got a mold line, it's going to show up. So yeah, next time we are on the show, we will. Uh, and actually, we're at time here. So Justin, start looking for a raid. But don't give me a raid just yet. I want to recap what I've done this show and finish these little pleats on his feet. But you can start thinking about who we want to raid. And I'm going to put, to just make sure that we've got some uh, metal on his feet also. But yeah, I mean, bottom line is, guys, all these metallics are going to work a little bit differently. So if you find a color you love and a consistency you love, use it. If you wonder if it mixes with your other um, acrylic metallics, the answer is probably yes. Uh, but you know, like I said, the uh, variation in the color of the flake and the pigment used in the paint, uh, will make it mix with varying levels of success or failure with, you know, other colors due to like pigment interaction, the way that colors interact. Some flakes love to mix together and some just are not so happy about it. Yeah, Skeleton Key's pretty. Sadie really likes metallics. Like, she's a good one to take over if you guys wanted a bunch of new metallics because she likes metallics. And more than I did. So, you will probably get many very pretty metallics. I mean, the purple one that she did was pretty nice, too. Oh, and the mermaid scale. I need to... I did that in my write-up. 
Oh, somebody asked the other day if I did triads for the Dungeon Dwellers cover colors that we were using. I actually did. Um, I've only done half of the Dungeon Dwellers, the first pack, the monster pack, but I did give triads for those. So if you are, if you have those colors and you're in my Patreon, which is patreon.com slash painting big, um, the $5 tier specifically is our color workshop tier where we talk about all this stuff. There are PDFs for the Dungeon Dwellers and they are, um, they do give like suggested usage and also suggested colors to highlight and shadow them with. There we are. All right, we have a very bling dwarf now. Extremely bling. Yes, and I still haven't decided on accent colors and that up there. So we'll just kind of like figure him out as we go. Um, but thank you for coming, everyone. Uh, we did a lot of metallic stuff. I recapped it earlier on, but I'm going to recap it again because it's the end of the stream. Uh, we talked about metallics. We swatched out some metallics and showed how they vary from uh, being over a light or a dark, showing how like the base color can be identical, um, even if the flake is different, uh, and how you can see that by tilting that uh, away from the light. Um, we talked about like kind of how metallics are made up. We talked about mixing them. We talked about thinning them. We talked about them on wet palettes and on traditional palettes. We did everything metallic-y today. There was much instruction. If you missed the earlier part of this, go back and watch it um, once it is on VOD or on YouTube. Uh, and there will be much metallic knowledge. And then the next time we do Mr. Dwarf, which will be in five days or so, uh, five or six days, um, we will start with like highlighting and shading and altering these colors um, to do that. So I hope you guys all had fun. New people who I haven't seen before, welcome to the stream. I'm Anne. I work for Reaper Miniatures. I made the Master Series paint line for 15 years uh, and then I moved. <laughs> so now I just uh, I work for Reaper part-time doing these streams every morning during the week. So do put us on your radar. Do hit the follow and or subscribe button. We appreciate all of your support. Alrighty. Uh, and who are we rating? Brush for Hire. Awesome. Have fun, say hello, and I'll be back tomorrow morning. Have a good one, everybody.